Um, we are drawing near to the time of Easter, just a few weeks away. If by the snow outside, you wouldn't say it's Easter is coming, but Easter is coming. So today, we will start a short series of only three messages with this topic in mind, preparing our hearts for, for Easter. So this is the first one. And I didn't want to stop for a few weeks from our regular study in the book of Acts, which I love. I love our I love my routines, I love my routine, I love to go through the book of Acts, and I enjoy that, but uh, for the first time in a long time, I felt the need to actually take a break and just focus on, on preparing um, for this, for the greatest celebration in Christendom, because uh, this is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which, which we shortly call Easter, that is it, it's the celebration of the greatest moment in our history, which is the day when Christ was re uh, has risen again. Uh, you know, it is a moment that is so important because without resurrection, Paul says everything is in vain. It says these words in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. My preaching is in vain, and your faith is also in vain or vain actually it says there you know so this is it's so important the problem is that we so much uh, in the church and people who call us as Christians all over the world no matter what denomination they part sometimes the reality of resurrection has been so impacted or affected by all the cultural changes and pressures that we seem that we have around us and we seem to no longer understand this majestic importance of this unique event you know, for, for us coming from Romania, there is something maybe cultural that comes, uh, you know, makes Easter even more, so somewhat more visible is the, the, how do you call that? The intensity of cleaning. I kid you not, it's like the couple of weeks before Easter, if you go, you'd, see, you'd say it's, it's like war outside for two things. The noise of the carpet beaters, boom, 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 all over the place, and the, the dust just coming up, especially Saturday mornings. You know, that was my job at my aunt's, aunt, aunt's, aunt's. That was my, I was the carpet beater, so I know that. And then all the cleaning, all the washing, everything. So you have this aspect, expectation, and then the, the Easter meal, the Easter Sunday, family coming together, and a small meal will have at least like five, six courses, and you know, all the noise and people together, and it's, it's all that excitement. Well, sometimes in the world around us, when Christianity is no longer the dominant cultural force, there's a pressure on, on us and it makes us kind of lose the feeling of the importance of this majestic event. And I want us to take a few weeks to, uh, before Good Friday and Easter Sunday to just remember, remember where we are and where we come from as Christians and fill our hearts with gratitude and worship for our amazing God and Savior. So I have this quote here, or well, not quote, it's like it's a saying, but we're burning daylight, let's go on. That's from John Wayne. So to understand our great need of salvation, to appreciate what we have today, I want us to actually step back up for a second and remember what we had. And I'm talking go back, all the way back to the book of Genesis. And if, you, if your memory is good, we actually spoke about these things about four years ago. And is it four? Yeah, it did. Whoa. 2018, you know, the spring of 2018, when I had this message where for a whole hour, I mean, hopefully not an hour, by God's grace, hopefully not an hour, I, I spoke about what we had in the beginning, that we were made in his image. And as, as humans, as man and woman back in, in Genesis, we, we carried God's image unmarked there fully, the way God made us in his image. And then we had his presence. We don't know how that looked like exactly, but we know man was in God's presence, enjoying his image, enjoy, enjoying his presence. I have no idea, maybe walking with the Lord in the cold of the morning. I, have no, I cannot even imagine how Adam and Eve fellowshiped with God, but they did. They had his presence and they had his authority. They had a bunch of, uh, not actually too many, there's some commandments and one uh, restriction, well, I'll go in English, not restriction, one thing they shouldn't have done, they shouldn't do, but uh, that's, they had God's authority, they had God's instruction with them, and they obeyed it to a point. 
We're talking about before the day the snake came in. They, got, they had God's presence, they had God's image, and they had God's authority, and they were enjoying it. And because they had those things, because rebellion was still not there, they had peace and they had rest. They enjoyed God's presence in peace and at rest. But then, as you all know, one day, man thought they can find good beyond God. They can find something better that God has withhold beyond what God has offered them already. And they started to search for that good outside God, and they lost everything. The image of God was no longer fully, was, I, like the, I use the word marred, it was still there, but was marred by sin. So that had to be restored in the end. They no longer had his presence. They were banished. They were now east of Eden. And their angels at the door, at the gate, whatever it is, and they couldn't go back in. They were banished from God's presence. And we know how rebellious man became against God's law and God's authority. When God said, fill up the earth, spread around and fill up the earth. And they disobeyed and they began to be evil. God brought the flood. And everybody except for uh, the Noah, Noah's family were wiped out. And when they spread out again and multiplied again and were supposed again to fill up the earth, they did what? They stayed in one place, willing disobedience. And they even, even built a tower that would reach up to heaven so that in case another flood comes. Well, it doesn't say this in the Bible. That's my take on it. Okay? So it's one of those asterisks uh, that I mentioned. I, you know, to me, it seems like they build a tower up to the heavens so that if a flood comes back, they'll have a place to find refuge. Rebellion, rebellion, rebellion. And of course, as you know, since uh, the curse that came upon Adam and Eve, they had no longer rest. All of these were lost. And as Fiona read, I'm going to actually, so I'm going to read again this passage I want to listen to these words from Ephesians chapter 2. So open your Bibles, please, Ephesians chapter 2. Use whatever translation you want or whatever device you want. But let's read this verse. I'm reading NASB uh, right now. It says here, And you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, of the spirit that there is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them were we, too, all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. This is why we need Christ, Christ's work at the cross. Because it says here, we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. There's a show, which I have not yet seen, I probably won't ever, called The Walking Dead. I think it's with zombies. Some, somebody, yeah, zombies. Okay, thank you. I don't like zombie movies. That's, you know, some, one thing I, I just, you know, I can tell you why. It just doesn't make sense. Anyway. Uh, but we were the, the initial Walking Dead. We thought we were alive, you know. We're, in our minds, we're just doing fine. But actually, in God's eyes, we were dead. Dead and walking and still rebelling. You know, we were, uh, it says here, we were, we, we obeyed the prince of the power of the air. Satan had dominion over us. And we just obeyed what he was saying and made us also sons of disobedience. By nature, we're creatures, sorry, we were children of wrath, deserving God's wrath. And that's where 1 John 2, 2 comes in so beautifully when it says that Christ is the propitiation for our sins. And if you don't know that word, it's a fancy word. I know. Christ was a sacrifice that removed God's wrath from us. That's the word propitiation. God, sorry, Christ is the sacrifice that removed God's wrath from us. That's why we need his work because without him, we're still under his wrath. And that's not a place where you want to be. We need the cross because there is where we get our life. So we had all that that you see here. Image, presence, authority. If you want also, I should have added obedience and peace and rest. And we lost them all because we thought 
There is more good beyond God. But God comes and redeems and restores. And in this passage, he gives us some hints. I'm going to read again. Actually, I'm going to continue from verse 4 through verse 10. So I'm going to read quite, I mean, slowly. If I, I'm going to try to read slowly. But just let the words sink in. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not by yourself, of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. You see, we walk again. We used to walk in the, in the sins of the past. We used to walk in obedience to the prince of the air. We used to walk, but we were dead. But for Christ, what he restored is first and foremost, life. We found life, life as it was meant to be. Although now we only have a foretaste of what is to come, we do have life. We do enjoy God's, actually we go back there, but we, are, we now walk. We walk being alive in Jesus. He made us alive together with Christ. That's the first amazing part. And even more, his image. His image is being formed in us. His image is being restored in us. And there are two ways. I clicked by accident, but actually it was the right thing to do. There are two ways the image is restored. If you read the books of Paul, you find these words, children of God. And when Paul writes those words, he means this, you got the rights that come with sonship or being a, a son or daughter of God. You have rights. You have, you have all those blessings that come because of God's promises. You are alive in Christ. You walk as he meant you to walk. And first and foremost, his image is restored in you. But then if you go, go more and you read the book of John, the, especially the letters, uh, epistles of John, you see a different kind of son there. Actually, in Greek, it's a different word for son. And it's the word that says, you look like your father. I had this shock about uh, a few years ago. I was walking by uh, in our hallway, and I walked by a mirror. I just glanced, you know, with, like, you know, perf, 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 my, you know, just looking sideways a bit, I, I froze because I saw my dad. I walked by the mirror and I saw my dad. I look so much like my father. I even, people say I even walk like my father. I have no idea how that is, but some guy once told me, hey, you, you walk just like your dad. It's like, I don't think he was very uh, appreciative of that. But anyway, there is something about sons looking like, like their fathers, or even daughters looking like their, their fathers or mothers. And John gives us this image. He says, you are sons of God because you look, you have the semblance of, of righteousness and holiness and love and all the things that first John, of the first letter of first John, you look like your father because God's image is restored in us. Okay, it's not even on the screen. Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Romans 8, 29. In order so that he, may, he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So we have life and his image is restored in us. Now we can walk as he wants us to walk. But even more, we have his presence. You know, remember that famous verse of John, 1 John, sorry, is John 1, 14, when it says that God, the word, sorry, word became flesh and he dwelt amongst us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son of, from the father, full of grace and truth. The word there is he made his tent 
in our midst. That's the word used in Greek. Of course, a, um, a, a reference to the Old Testament, to the, 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 the tabernacle, where God came and dwelt in the midst of his people, where glory dwelt. If he, Exodus 40, at the end, when, when Moses finally finishes the, the, the tabernacle as God ordained it, the glory comes down and fills the temple and God dwells, dwells in the midst of his people. And when they march, God goes ahead of them. When they stop, God is in their midst. Remember this in Numbers? Oh boy, I miss, I, I, I want to teach that book once, once sometimes, you know. There's something beautiful about the, the Numbers, about the order they say, you know, when they march, what goes first, remember? It's the, the, the Ark, thank you. The Ark of the Covenant goes first. God goes before them. And when they make camp, they put in the middle what? In the center of the camp, it is what? Again, the Ark of the Covenant. God is always either in the midst or ahead of them, leading them. God's presence is with us since the Word became flesh and made His tabernacle in our midst. And of course, the promise I always go back to, it's Matthew 28, 20. And I will be with you. I'm sorry, I am with you always until the end of the age. I am with you always. That's a promise. We have his presence. And the Holy Spirit in us, the Holy Spirit with us, guarantees his presence in our midst. And it's amazing. And I come back to what I say when I teach the book of Acts. God has never promised us comfort. But he did promises, promised us presence. And that's the essence, one of the main themes of the book of Acts. We can continue despite whatever the world throws at us because God is with us. Emmanuel. Isn't that it, Emmanuel? Gott mit uns? Yeah. And of course, it's not just his image in us. It's not just his presence with us. But again, he brings this ministry, this work of his in us, that his law, his authority, his instruction is now in us, changing us from within and allowing us to act and to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Hebrews 10, 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in, on their hearts and write them on their minds. And the author of Hebrews here quotes Jeremiah. But the point is, we have his instruction. And by God's mercy, by God's grace, we have learned again the beauty, the pleasure of obedience, obeying and loving a gracious and holy God. And we learned again that we are his brothers and sisters as we obey his commandments. Obedience has been restored, not forcefully, not through a law, but through a sacrifice. And in the end, his rest for all of us. Come unto me, all ye who labor and heavy burdened, and I will give you more work. No, I'm just kidding, sorry. I will give you rest. And that is a rest, a special rest, a rest of Christ. There's a whole chapter, actually, chapter 4 in Hebrews, that speaks about this kind of rest we have received in the Lord Jesus. I'm not going there now, but... God has restored even that. And may I mention the promise, peace I give to you. My peace I give to you. Not like the world gives. The world has no clue what peace looks like. The world has invented different ah, replacements for peace, whether it's finances or pleasures or you know, the usual uh, joys quote unquote, of the world, in which, in which people think they can find peace. But the real peace, the lasting peace, the actual only peace is given to us by Jesus. So how do we make this personal? How do we take from, how do we go from Ephesians chapter 2, which I please go back home and read it again and again this today. You know, this is, this is my homework for you. Go back and just read Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and just meditate upon that word. Do what... The psalmist writes in Psalms 1, you know, find your pleasure, or you know, so many psalms, find your pleasure in meditation upon this word. I'm glad I'm not teaching psalms because it's so hard for me to not say psalms. 
Because in rainy, we actually, the P is not silent, so PSA is, it's hard. Anyway, how do we make this personal? How do we go from the craziness of the world outside to a time to be grateful? Well, let me say this. And I, I, I thought about this phrase until, because it felt a bit uncanny, it's a bit tough, you know, a bit harsh, but it's, it's true. So I chose to put it back in, in the sermon's notes because it's true. We cannot truly appreciate Easter or the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord, until we fully understand our depravity, where we come from, our sinfulness, where we, what we had before the fall, all those blessings of his presence, his image, and all the things I said, and what we lost because of sin, and the cost of being separated from God, the life without God. I hope you do remember those days before you made a pledge with God, or for some of you, maybe even today, when you live a life attempting to find peace, but finding none because there is no true peace besides Jesus, the one that Jesus gives. What we had, what we lost, and the cost of trying to live with that. We had life, and we ended up having death. That was God's warning. I wouldn't even say it was a, a curse. It was just a warning. You think you'll live? You think you'll find life? The moment you do that, you will find death. The walking dead, walking our trespasses and sins, ready for the righteous wrath of the Almighty. But now we know the depravity of human heart, and we know where we come from. Sometimes I speak with people that grew up in Christian churches, Christian families especially, and they think they're good. They think that because they don't do this and don't do that, and they do this and do that, you know, their actions justify them. And they, they're not focused on where their heart is. They're just focused on the things they do well. And it's not about that, it's about our heart, because that's where the, everything stems. And devils lie within the last, at least, especially the last four centuries, since the 1600s, has been that humans are intrinsically good. Now, humans are, by nature, good. You know, there's nothing wrong with you when you're born. It's, you're perfect, morally, actually, even avoid the word moral, because moral involves a moral authority, which is God, and they want to avoid that. But they say man is good. And the problem is that society perverts human beings. It's not that we're bad. It's just the world makes us bad, you know. So it's not our fault. It's the world's fault. So this, this, this running away from responsibility, saying, it's not my fault if I'm like this. It's everything that's around me. I read an article recently, this actually this week, and I'm sorry I didn't save it. I, I lost it. I have no idea how to go back and find it. But there's this article on, on Facebook and through Facebook, through a website, in which uh, the author said men, men, guys, are not to be blamed from temp for temptations. There's nothing with, like, you know, we're not built to be tempted. We're not, you know, testosterone has nothing to do with that. It's the church that tells us we, sh we are tempted, and because of that, the church makes men be tempted. I was, I was, I was 20, I was 20, I was 18, I was 15, I was, I had, way, I had never been in a church before, like ever. And I knew what temptation was. The church had nothing to do with my temp being tempted, you know, or society, or, you know. I just, ugh. never mind. There's a devil's lie right there that is trying to say, you're good. You're good enough. You have, there's nothing for you to, to ch there's nothing that you should, should change. You know, you don't need God. There is peace out there. But that's a lie because we know what we had. We know what we lost. We know the cost of being under God's wrath. You know, I'm going to adapt here. And this is, uh, Gary, if you're listening, this is for you. <sighs> to be thankful, Gary, the other one, not you. To be thankful for what you have, be thankful for what you have escaped. John Wayne. To be thankful for what you have, be thankful for what you have escaped. Until you understand your depravity, you cannot fully appreciate Easter. You are thankful for God's work at the cross when you understand how much you need 
that work. This season before the Resurrection Sunday is a season for of meditation upon the goodness of God and of gratefulness for his love, his mercy and grace. This is the time when we want to get away from the heathenism of the world around us that is pressing against us, trying to drive us away from God. It is a time when we set again on the path towards God, you know, like Moses going up a mountain, or like Jesus going up a mountain as a metaphor of drawing near to God, the mountain of God's word and the mountain of his presence in your life. If you've been a Christian for a while, and many of you have, my prayer is that your heart will be refreshed as you draw near to Jesus. Just like in Psalms 1 it says, and in his law he or she meditates day and night. He or she will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water. So my prayer for me and for us all today is that we would increase our receptivity Ability to receive what God has for us. Receptivity, I think is the word in English. To his presence all around us. Even if we don't feel him, his presence is all around us. Ever, ever ask yourself, why is there... Why is Esther the book of in the Bible? Because God is never mentioned in the book of Esther. Did you notice that? God is never mentioned. Unless you're Russian. And read the Bible in Russian because in Russian they actually added the word God at one point just to put the word God in the book of Esther, but it wasn't there before. There's this uh, um, theological concept of God's hiddenness. Even when you don't see him, he's still at work. Wasn't that the song we sang last week? Even, in, even when I don't see you, you're still at work. So my prayer is again that we would be a bit, again able to feel his presence around us as we meditate, meditate upon his word and no longer be deafened and especially desensitized by all the cultural pressure around us. And I'm praying that God's kingdom will be more and more present in our midst, in our thoughts and actions and discussions and everything around us, that awe of being Christians. Remember those days when we first walked with God and you were in awe of this newfound life and the hope in the future, and you just couldn't shut up about that. And you talk about it, and sometimes you see people laugh at you, and, and usually, gradually, you kind of lose interest of saying it loud because you just, just hate being mocked or laughed at, and that's a problem we all have, well, at least I have. But boy, that love of the first, that love, that first love, that first passion, may that be restored in me and in all of us, and the joy of being in the Lord, the joy of being called Christians. But as we started, I'm going to end with the same things. Let us be grateful today for the ministry of restoration and redemption. God restores. Everything that devil stole, God can and will restore. Everything that was destroyed by the devil will be restored. One of my prayers that me and Pastor Joe, my, my good friend, we pray sometimes is, uh, actually quite often, is from Joel, the second chapter, that the Lord would restore the years that the locust has eaten. You know, And that's my prayer. For all the broken relationships, all the sins that I have or we have committed, I know God has the power and the will to restore. And I want to be thankful that his image is in us now restored, that his presence is with us unbroken, that his law is our delight, and that we can finally rest with the Prince of Peace. If you never called God Father, if you're here or online and have never, you have never called God Father, if the very idea of peace and rest seems unattainable, please take this words from me now. There is good news then there is hope because God can restore and redeem whatever you see today as lost, destroyed, and beyond redemption. God's work is to work out the impossible and what you call today forever gone, God can restore. The only thing we need to do is to come before him in faith with a heart of repentance and God will do the rest. But let's go praying. Let's get praying for this. A burning daylight, like 
John Wayne said. <laughs>